We have just discussed the fascinating phenomenon of conformity. People adjusting their behavior as a result of group pressure. After the Second World War, scientists looked to these type of theories to explain why so many people had kept quiet during the reign of Hitler. Well, quite obviously during the war there was a very real fear of punishment. But also, according to Elizabeth Noel Neumann, a fear of being socially isolated. Her theories explain exactly how conformity works on a large scale. Noel Neumann supposes that people are in essence social animals. Therefore, we need to be part of our social environment. Consequently, we are afraid that if we disagree with dominant views in society, we will in fact isolate ourselves. And we know, according to Noel Neumann, exactly how to behave to prevent this. Because we have become very good in monitoring public opinion, in seeing which views and actions are popular and which are taboo. Because of our fears, there is a tendency to keep silent whenever we disagree with popular views and not voice opinions that are unpopular. She called this the spiral of silence. Because if everyone is silent about their disapproval of, let's say, Hitler, then others will observe this and are more likely to keep silent themselves as well. Thus, conformity breeds more conformity. And it becomes possible that a silent majority is following the lead of a very loud minority. Although the theory was developed with Second World War Germany in mind, it applies to many current situations, both on a societal and a group level. It explains how we use uncertainty reduction strategies to tweak our behavior and even our own views to fit in better socially and culturally. Okay, these are just some theories out of many that cover how we use communication to give meaning to the world around us, to construct, as you will, a cultural reality. We have also talked this week about how we don't do this by ourselves, but in fact, constantly create and maintain this reality within cultural groups and society as a whole, leading in fact to many cultural realities existing at the same time. The principle of cultural relativism. On the other hand, some theories suggest one dominant cultural reality, communicated on a large scale through pop culture and strengthened by people's tendency to conform to public opinion. Well, this ends this week's lectures on the cultural approach. But the discussion will continue. What do you see around you? Cultural relativism? Or indeed one dominant culture? Scholars are still divided on the issue. So I'm very curious where you stand in this debate. Let us know on the forum. Next week. In only five weeks we went with the speed of lightning through a complicated forest of scientific thought. It was of course necessary to take some shortcuts on the way to reach our destination in time. And I'm thoroughly impressed with how fast you have all processed such a huge amount of information in such a short time and without any actual class interaction outside of the virtual world. Next week, however, we have time to slow things down a bit and focus on issues that could use some more attention. It's all about your input. And many of you have already added some suggestions on our forum that I will use next week. So next time, a lecture completely inspired by your feedback. I hope to see you then.